My name is Keshwani. That's K-E-S-H-W-A-N-I. Keshwani. We are here because we want to prepare for GMAT. We have been solving GMAT math problems out of this book here. The GMAT Official Guide 2022. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You are going to need it. Always make sure that this, that, that this book is in front of you when you are working with me. Today I will solve some problem that you will find on page number 131. The very first problem that you see on that page number 124 as you can see is already on the blackboard. It says that in 2007 the milk production was 980 million pounds. In 2014 it was 2.7 billion pounds. The question simply is how much more milk are we producing but we have to give the answer in gallons. And we are given, this information is given to us that one, one gallon equals 8.6 pounds. The conversion rate is given to us. So let's see what we can do. And they are looking for the approximate answer. They are looking for the approximate answer, which is very, very important. We don't have to do the precise work. So that's exactly what we're going to do here. 980 million pounds, we're going to pretend that it is 1,000 million pounds, approximately. 980 is approximately 1 million. 1,000 1, 000, 1, 000 million. <coughs> And here we have 2.7 billion, which is same as 2,700 million. So we're simply going from 1,000 to 2,700. That's an increase of 1,700, 1,700 million pound. Now we don't want the answer in pound. We want it in gallons. So now we have to do conversion. We want to get rid of pound, and we want the gallon. So we want to put the gallon on the top. One gallon, we are told, is equal to 8.6. Pound. Let's multiply top and bottom by 10 so we can get rid of this 0.6 business, the decimal business. Let's multiply top and bottom by 10. So this is going to be 86, so what we end up is 1700 times 10. And we're going to write our 1700 as 17 times 100. 1700 times 10. And on the bottom we end up in 86. At this point we're going to do approximation one more time. We have to understand and we have to recognize the 17 times 5 is exactly 85. 17 times 5 is exactly 85. So we're going to pretend that this is actually 85. This is second approximation. 17 times 5 is a set already. 7 5 is a 35. 3 is 85. There we go. Divide top and bottom by 17 and we can get rid of the 17 as 85 becomes 5. Divide top and bottom by 5 again, 5 goes away and 10 becomes 2, we end up with 2 times 100, the answer simply is, this quantity is same as 200, not, not pound, but gallon. The increase is 200 gallons. That was 124, let's go to number 125. In 125 we are told, oh it's a, it's a, it's a work time problem, we are told, that four machines can produce X units in six days. That's what we are told. The question is how many machines do we need? How many how many do we need? How many machines that is? How many machines do we need to produce to produce three X units in four days? So there are two things going on here. One thing is that here we are producing X units, so of X unit we have to produce three X units, three times as many units, and the second is that we have less time. Instead of six days, we have four days. So there are two things we need to, we need to take care of. And the key here is try is to convert one or take care of one thing at a time. Don't try to do both at once. Do the one thing at a time. This is very straightforward. We know four machines can produce X units, X units in six days. If that's true, then if you were to have three X units, if you were to have if you were to do three times the amount of work, we'll need three times three times as many machines. Three times as many machines should be able to produce three times the three times the amount of work in six days. So that part is done. Now we worry about the days. Let's talk about the days then. 
So this is six days. Instead of six days, instead of six days, if you were to try to do that in one day, instead of six days, if you were to try to do that one day, you will have to have six times as many machines. Because you're trying to do all that work in one day, so you can have six times as many machines. That's one day. When we don't have one day, we actually have four days. So this tells us that three times four times six, this is how many machines we need to produce three X units, three X units in, in one day. But we don't have one day, we actually have four days. So if you were to do that in four days, then this implies that if you were, if you were to do the same amount of work in four days, instead of one days, if you have four days, we need one fourth the amount of machine. There we go. We, know we need one fourth the amount of machine to do the same work, three X units in four days. The four goes away and the answer is we need 18 machines. That's all there is. We need 18 machines. That was 125. 126 we are told that 6 operation 3 is less than or equal to 3. And we are told that this operation denotes, this, I'm, not, I'm not going to write everything, this symbol here denotes one of the four basic arithmetic operations. It's either addition, subtraction, multiplication or division. It is up to us to figure out which one it is. Maybe it's one or maybe it's more than one. But that is true. Before we worry, before we worry about what is being asked, before we worry about well, about what is being asked, ah, let's figure out which operation it, it works for. For example, does it work for addition? 6 plus 3. Is 6 plus 3 less than or equal to 3? The answer is no. So it does not work for addition. It doesn't work for addition. How about subtraction? 6 minus 3 is less than or equal to 3. That is true. That works. So it's either subtraction. It works for subtraction. How about multiplication? 6 times 3 is less than or equal to 3. That's not true. It doesn't work for multiplication. How about division? 6 divided by 3 is less than or equal to 3. 6 divided by 3 is 2. And 2 is indeed less than or equal to 3. That does work. So it works for division as well. Now we can look at what they are asking. We have three statements that are given to us. We have to figure out which one of those three statements are true. Here is the first one. The first statement says, I'm going to erase this thing here so that we don't have this annoying part. The first statement says that 2 operations 2 equals 0. Now it has to work for both of these things. They have to work for subtraction and division. 2 minus 2, oh that, that does work. That does that is indeed true. What about division? 2 divided by 2 does not equal 0. It doesn't work. Statement 1 is not true. The statement, work, statement 1 is only partially true. It's not it's not, it's not true all the way. It doesn't work for both scenarios. How about second one? It says 2 operations 2 is equal to 1. Let's see if that works. So again, 2 minus 2 is, does not equal 1. 2 minus 2 does not equal 1. That doesn't work. How about statement number 3? 126 is what we're doing with here. 126. And since since among the five answer choices, there is no answer choice which says none of the above, which means statement 3 must be true. It has to be because there is no answer which says none of the above. 4 operations 2, we are told is equal to 2. Let's see if that is true. That is actually true. We don't have to do it out. It's very simple. 4 minus 2, 4 minus 2 does equal 2 and so does 4 divided by 2. 4 divided by 2 does equal 2 as well. It works for both subtraction and division. So the answer is 3 only. 3 only. It doesn't work for 1. Statement 1 is not true. Statement 2 is not true. Statement 3 is indeed true. Or to be more precise, 1 and 2 are not entirely true. Number 127. In 127 we are told that 25% of N is equal to thirty-seven and a half percent of M. And what we're looking for is how much is twelve times N over M. This is what we're trying to figure out. Let's see what we can do. 
12, 25% of n, 25% of n is simply 25 over 100 times n is equal to 37% of n. You understand? Don't write this as one quarter. Get to you to, to, the idea here is to make the work as simple as possible. If you make it one quarter, you're creating more work. So just divide, uh, multiply, uh, multiply both sides by 100, you can get rid of it. Now we can look at n over m. n is already here, we just bring n over here and bring 25 down there. So n over m is simply 37 and a half over, bring the 25 down. And now we work on it, we simplify it. Multiply both the top and bottom by 4. Multiply top and bottom by 4 so that we can get 100 at the bottom. It's much easier to deal with 100. Let's do this, shall we? So here's where the tricky part comes in. Pay attention. Here we go. This, this, this 3 that you see here is not a 3. This 3 is not a 3. The reason, reason why it is called 37 is because it's made up of 30 and a 7. So let's, let's begin. 30 times 4 is 120. 7 times 4 is 28. And half of 4 is 2. There we go. That's very easy. 28 plus 2 is uh, 30. 30 plus 120 is 150. That's very nice. So we end up with 150. 150 over 100. And that's simply 3 halves. That's n over m. We're not interested in finding out what is n over m. We want to find out 12 times that amount. So let's do that. So 12 times n over m will simply be 12 times this quantity, 3 halves. There we go, 6 times 3 is 18. Oh, the answer is again 18. What do you know? The answer was 18 also last time, if you remember. That was 127. That was 127. Let's do 128. 128 is a very silly question. It's a gift. Here's what we're told. We're told that J grew by one inch. We're further told that S grew 200% more, more than J. Question simply is, if that's true, then how much did, how much did S grew? How much did S grow? Not S grew. How much did S grow? Well, it's very easy. We know that S grew by 200% more. Not by 200%, but 200% more. That's the important word. 200% more. 200% of 1 is 2. So S must, have grow, S must have grown by 2 more inches than what J grew. So there you go. It implies that S must have grown, must have grown by 3 inches. Because it grew by 200 percent more. That's all. 129. You just have to pay attention to the wording. It says it grew 200 percent more. Not by 200 percent. It did not grow by 200 percent of what S J grew. It grew 200 percent more. So it grew two more inches than what the other guy did. Therefore, this guy S grew by three inches. That was number, I lost track of it. Where were we? We were on 128, 129, the very last problem on that page. We are told that we are running a store uh, where we are given a... Uh, we, we, are, we, are, we did a survey and we asked consumer which of these factors influence their decision to buy something. We are told that it's a partial list. It's right, it says right there and they underline it. They're telling us the partial result. That's their way of saying that if you add up all the figures, it's not going to add up to 100%. It's a partial result. So when we ask the customers what influenced their decision to buy this particular product, 35% of people said that we, we saw the TV commercial, therefore we are buying it. 22% said that we want to buy it because we have a coupon for it. Uh, 18% said that we decided to buy it because we saw some display, maybe a neon sign or something. And 15% said that we want to buy it because we tried out a sample and we like the sample. 
question is this. So if you add up first of all, uh, this is 2 plus 8 is 10, this is 10, that's 20. So 0, carry 2, that's 5, and that's 4, that's 90%. You see, it's, it's the partial result. The question is, what's the ratio of C or D, coupon or display, over total? That's what it is. All that fuss about nothing. Coupon or display, which is right here, I already put that into there. That 22 plus 18, that's 40. It's 40 percent out of a 90 percent, so the answer is 490. Very simple, very straightforward. Number 130 on the next page. Number 130 on the next page. I'm going to take a quick break for one second. In 130 we are told that we have 65% employees in a firm, 65% of the employees are full-time. We are also told that we have 5,100 more full-time employees, more full-time employees than part-time. In other words, the number of full-time employees is 5,100 plus the part-time. Well, P represents the number of part-time employees. What we want to find out is the total. How many total employees do we have? Well, obviously, the total employees that we have has to equal the full-time plus the part-time. Right now, we have three unknown going on here. Let's, let's, let's get rid of this F by using the fact that number of full-time employees is 5,100 more than the part-time employees, right there. 5100 plus part time plus P, so we end up with 5100 plus 2P. We still have this P unknown. We have to have the equation in one variable before we can solve for it. Where is where is the second? How where are we going? To, how do we get rid of this P? There is a first. That was the second equation. That's the first equation. That's the first equation. That's the first equation here. It says that we have 65% full time. That means. The number of part-time employees that we have must be 35% of total, obviously. If 65% of people are full-time, the remaining 35% must be part-time. That's what we're going to put here. 5100 plus 2 times P, which has to be 35% of the total. Right there, 35% of the total. 2 times 0.35 is 0.7. Sub subtract 0.7 from both sides, we'll end up with 0.3T equals 5100. There we go. Let's continue this thing on the top so we don't keep writing it way down there. So we continue this on the top, multiply both sides by 10 and we end up with 3t equals 5100 times 10. Divide both sides by t 3 and we end up with 5100, 5100 which I'm going to write that as 51 100 times 10 over 3. I wanted to separate the 51 and 100 because we're going to divide top and bottom by 3. Because obviously we're not going to divide 10, we're not going to use 10 over 100. Divide top and bottom by 3. 5, 5 is 1, 3. 5 is 1, 3. After we take away 3 from the 5, we have a remainder of 2. 2 goes and joins the 1, then becomes 21. And 21 is made up of 7, 3. 7, 3 is a 21. In other words, 17 times 3 is 51, which of course we knew. There we go. That's it. So, it's, so the total number of employees that we have is 17 times 1000. 100 times 10 is 1000. Oh, don't ask me why I had the urge to point that out to you. Sometimes I do. Number 131. Sometimes I just have the urges to point out the bloody obvious. 131. In 131, we, we are told that cost is equal to 100,000 times P over 100 minus P, where P represents, represents the percentage of pollutant 
remove. We are removing some pollutant from a lake. We are going to clean up this lake. It's filthy, it's dirty, it's polluted. And the town has decided to get rid of the pollut pollutants in the lake. And they found, they hired somebody and, and the equation that they, they were given is this. They are told the cost of removing a pollutant is 100,000 times P, which P represents the percentage. In other, in other words, if you want to remove only half the pollutant from the lake, 50%, you are going to put in 50 here, 50 here, that will give us the cost. The question is, how much more does it cost to remove 90% of the pollutant as opposed to removing, as opposed to removing only 80%? How much more will it cost to remove this additional 10% of the pollutant? We can stop at removing 80% of the pollutant or we, we can go from another 10% to 90%. How much more does it cost? Let's find out. Cost of removing 90% of the pollutant is simply 100,000 times 90 over 100 minus 90 which is 10. So that's very straightforward. It goes away. And 9 times 100 is 900,000. That's how much it costs. Let's find out how much it costs to remove 80% of the pollutant. If you want to remove only 80% of the pollutant, we'll have 100,000 times 80, because we're removing 80%. And in the bottom, we'll have it end up having 100 minus 80, which is 20. Divide top and bottom by 10. Divide top and bottom by 2. There we go. Four times hundred thousand. In other words, in other words, if you want, in other words, if we want to stop at just eighty percent of the pollutant having been removed, we only have to spend four hundred thousand dollars. Four times a hundred thousand. How much more does it cost? It seems like it costs an extra half a million dollars to removing to remove the additional ten percent of the pollutant. The first eighty percent only costs. 400,000. But if you want to go remove another 10%, the cost goes up astronomically all the way up to half a million. It costs half a million more dollars to remove that extra 10% of the pollutant. That's, that's all there is. That was 131. What do we have in 132? In 132, we are told that x squared minus y x squared times y squared minus xy equals 6. And we are being asked to solve y, solve for y in terms of x. Now there are two ways we can go about it. It's up to you. You can solve it in a very classical, very, very orthodox, very conventional, very algebraic way. Which is, which is to set it up as a quadratic, quadratic equation. If that's what you want to do, be my guess. I'm not going to do it that way. If you want to solve it, in, 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 so set it up as a quadratic, quadratic equation, this is what you will have to do. We will have to define a new variable. Let a, let's say for example, a equals x times y. So this becomes a squared minus a minus 6, x equal to 0. And you solve this quadratic equation and figure out a equals 2, which is x times y. That's one way of doing it. It's not complicated, but I'm not going to go that way. I'm not going to go that way. We're not going to go that way because it's not necessary. It's very straightforward. Look, if we take x, x times y common, we end up with xy minus 1 equals 6. What two numbers do you think, can, can you think of where one number times one less than the other number will equal 6? Obviously, 3 times 2. So that's one possibility. Other possibility is negative. Negative 3, negative 3 times negative 2 is also 6. But, we have, to, we have to switch the places. It cannot be negative 3 here, because if you put a negative 3 for x times y, here we'll end up with negative 3 minus negative 1, we'll end up with negative 4. We have to switch places. So now x times y has to be negative 2 times negative 2 minus negative 1. You see, negative 2 minus negative 1. And that would work, negative 2 times negative 3. In other words, in other words x times y, here, here we find, here we find that x times y is 3. And here we find that x times y would have to be negative 2. There we go. And since we want to solve for y, this implies that y would have to equal 3 over x. So that's one possibility. Another possibility is, if we solve this one for y, 
y would have to equal negative 2 times x. There we go. We are given three statements. In the answer choices, we are given three statements. And obviously only two of those three statements will be, will be something that would work. And we have to figure out which one it is. 1 over 2x. It's not, it's not the first one. Second one says negative 2 over x. There you go, negative 2 over x. That's the second statement. So this one is the third statement. Third one says 3 over x. There you go. So the answer is statement number 2 and 3. They are correct. 2 and 3. And that's the last answer. Answer choice E. Let's go to 132. 133, shall we? 133 is very straightforward, very simple, very sweet. And I like sweet because those are gifts. 133 simply says, what is the approximate value of 4.8 times 10 raised to 9? And since they are looking for approximate value, that's exactly what we're going to do. Because if you try to figure out the precise value, we're not going to go anywhere. Trying to figure out the score of 4.8 is not going to work. The key here is to understand that if we and uh, we cannot also figure out square root of 10, or 10 raised to 9, but we can figure out square root of 10 raised to 8. The square root of 10 raised to 8 is simply 10 raised to 4. So make this 10 raised to 8 and bring the 10 and use it here, make it 48. Once it becomes 48, treat that 48 as 49. Treat that 48 as 49. And that's where the approximation comes in. There you go, we're done. The square root of 49 is 7. We already figured out square root of 10 raised to 8 is 10 raised to 4, which is simply 7 with 4 zeros. 1, 2, 3, 4, looks like 70,000 is the answer. That was one, 133. That was the end of the first column on, the, on, the, on that page. Let's go to the second column, 134. We are told that 80% of the students are taking chemistry. We are also told that 60% of this 80%, these people, 60% of these people are also taking physics. We are further told that 10% are taking neither. 10% of the students are taking neither. What we want to find out is what percentage is taking physics. What percentage is taking physics? What we need to understand here is that the percentage of people that we are looking for here, the percentage of people taking physics, are those people who are taking only physics and also those people who happen to be taking physics and chemistry because they are also taking physics. So let's set it up as a Venn diagram. That's the simplest way to do it here. I shouldn't have taken up this much room to write everything. Now we have to do, draw the Venn diagram down here. So here is our chemistry. Here is our physics. And let's get going. So these are percentages. We're going to use numbers. We're going to pretend that there are only 100 students. 80% are taking chemistry. So 80% are taking chemistry. 60% of that 80%, 60% of the 80%, 6 times 8 is 48, 6 is a 48, which means 48 of those 80 people, 48 of, 48 of those 80 people are also taking physics, they're taking both. Once we insert a figure here, which is overlapping both sides, we need to subtract 48 from here, because otherwise we'll end up double counting these 48 people. 80 minus 50 is exactly 30, so this should be 32. So that takes care of that part. We also know that 10% are taking neither. Now we have to see what they add up to. So we have 48, we have 32, and we have 10. Let's see what they add up to. 48, 32, and 10. That's a, that's a 0, uh, 8, or 4, 8, no, that's 90. There you go. Which means there must be 10 people out of 100 who are taking only physics. Now, we want to find out how many people are taking physics. The answer to that is there are 10 people who are taking only physics and there are also 48 people who are also taking physics but they are also taking chemistry. But that does not interest us. What interests us is how many people, what percentage are taking physics. The answer is 
these 48 people and these 10 people. 58 people are taking physics, or to be more precise, 58%, 58% of the people are taking physics. 58% of the students are taking physics. Number 135. Number 135 is asking us to identify the unit digit of 5. Point, or rather 5610.37 over 10 raised to k is 6. It's not, it's not asking us to identify the unit digit. What, what it's asking us is what must be the value of k, what must be the value of this exponent k for this to be true, for the unit digit to be 6. Well, the unit digit is right here. The unit digit is right here, obviously. Oh, sorry, rather, I meant to say 6. The 6 is right here. The 6 is right here. We want to make that into a unit digit. If you want to make that into a unit digit, we need to take this decimal and move it two places, which means k must be 2. We must it's divided by 100. There is nothing to do here. There is not much to do here. If we divide this quantity by 100, we'll end up with, in other words, 5610.37 divided by 100 will give us 56.1037. There you go. Now the unit digit is 6. Therefore, k must be 2. We are making too much fuss about not really much at all. Let's go to the next one, shall we? The very last problem on that page. We are told that we have three people. R, S and T we are told, they take, when they are working together, all three of them together at their respective pace, respective pace, they take four hours to do a job, whatever the job happens to be, it really doesn't interest us. We also told that when R and S work together, only R and S, without the, S and T rather, when S and T work together without R, they take five hours. Question is, how long does R take to do the entire job by himself? I'm not going to write everything on the blackboard, but that's the idea. How long will it take R if he were to do the job himself, entire job by himself? Well, let's see. Let's see what we can do. So, since R and S so let's put, raise this thing here. We're looking for how long does R take to do the job by himself. Since, since we know that S and, T, S and T together take five hours to do the job, to do the job, to do, instead of saying to do just the job, I'm going to say to do one job, a job. Uh, S and T take five hours to do one job. That implies, that implies that S and T should be able to do one-fifth of the job in one hour because they take five hours to get together. If they do one-fifth of the job in one hour, that also implies that in four hours, in four hours, they must do four-fifths of the job. S and T, that is. Are you with me? If S and T can do if S and, T, S and T together can do four-fifths of the job in four hours, and since that's how long it takes for all of them working together, all of them working together, they take four hours, and now we know that in four hours S and T, S and T do one-fifth of the job, that, that must mean, that must mean, that implies that S must do, he must do the remaining one-fifth of the job in four hours. Because we know in four hours they are done. When they are working together in four hours they are done. If we can do a fifth of the job in four hours, if he can do fifth of the job in four hours, if he wants to do the entire job by himself, he needs he need to have five times the amount of time. 
if he has five times the amount of time, he can do the entire job because one fifth takes four hours, therefore five fifths must take four times five. In other words, he can do the job all by himself very nicely if you give him 20 hours. Because we know that in four hours, SNT did, did four fifths of the job, which means Mr. R must have done one fifth of the job in four hours. If he does one fifth of the job in four hours, give him 20 hours and he can do the entire job. I'm repeating myself, you understand? That was the end of the page. We're going to stop right here. It seems like a logical place. Tomorrow when we meet, on day number 11 that is, tomorrow we will meet, we'll start doing some data sufficiency problems. We have not touched data sufficiency problem at all, problems at all. I don't want to keep continuing with the multiple choice problems. We're going to do, start doing the data sufficiency problems from tomorrow. Okay? In the meantime, if you wish to get hold of me, if you would like to work with me, if you would like to hire me to get you ready for the exam, all you have to do is send me an email. Go to my website at kashwaniprev.com. From there, you can send me an email, or if you wish, you can fill out a form. If you want to tell me a little bit more about yourself, and we'll talk some more. All right? I'll see you tomorrow. Okay? Bye now.